So you've got your wool, you've got your needles, you've got your felting base. But what about a wooden letter opener? What about some hair straighteners? I'm going to walk you through my top 15 favourite tools and materials and I'm going to show you how I use them. I think these are some of the best items that you can be using to help create those detailed and realistic needle felted animals. Hi, I'm Amanda Adivisi of Fit To Be Loved and on this channel I'll teach you the techniques to create cute and realistic animals. If you would like to become a more confident felter and advance your skills, be sure to hit the red subscribe button below. So let me get started on those tools. I'm not saying you have to go out and buy all of these things, although you might want to put them on your Christmas list or on your birthday list. You might even find that you have them just around the house. So let's start off with number one with needles. Now you may have some needles already, but I can't do without mentioning these needles. The 38 star here is the most amazing needle. I could literally make a whole animal uh, with this one needle, with the edges here, the four edges, making it a really fast felting needle. On my little doggy here, you can see I'm going to start just stabbing in and it just makes the most amazing kind of finish as well as, as being really fast. And I just love this needle the most. I could not live without this one needle. It makes a lovely finish here. Um, so the second needle here is the twisted needle. There's two twisted needles here, actually. We've got um, two different gauges. We have the 38 twisted. And I use these needles to get a really great finish. When people ask about a really smooth finish, you could really see that it's only tiny, tiny holes in there that you're stabbing in. And obviously this 38 is not going to be quite as thin as the 40 twisted. So this is even more finer, finer finish, brilliant finish on this little dog here with the twisted needles. You can kind of see closely that you really, you see a few holes, but it's not going to be as big as the holes that you get maybe on a, on a triangle. Um, and I just carry on when I get to the end of my sculpture. This is the one that I use just to finish off things nicely. So I could work with just the 38 star, but this one here, um, it's like a little drill being twisted, pulling the little fibers in. And finally, we have the reverse needle. And this is just fantastic using a reverse needle. I'll show you on this ball here that I've made. Um, the reverse needle has the barbs going in the opposite direction and you'll see that it's just slightly different. So normally you'd stab in, but you're pulling out with the reverse needle. So instead of pushing the fibres to sculpt, you're actually pulling them out, pulling little bits of fluffy amounts of almost like hair out each time. So you can see as I'm pulling, be careful with your fingers, but just as you pull, you'll see that I'm pulling out the little fluffy bits. And I'll just carry on doing this with this needle just to show you the effect here. And this is great for making long, fluffy, furry animals. I love my long fur technique, but I also just sometimes want to get that baby fluff look. You can see the little fibres here. Now it's very important that when you make your sculpture to start with, it needs to be very firm. If you make it too soft, then when you pull out the fibres, you're obviously going to be pulling out some of those fibres from within and it won't be so stable. Um, and so you really need to make sure it's really firm to start with. So I, I hope you get the idea. This is a wonderful, wonderful needle. So I find it helps to just tease out the little bits as well. You can always trim it later and tidy it up. Um, but that just helps to bring out the fibres. There you go. So you can see this little bee here is only half reverse felted. Um, it's fluffy at the bottom and not at the top. Now with my tabby cat, I'm putting in the details with a normal um, star needle to put in the dots. But then what I'm going to do is use my reverse needle. It's very versatile. You can also use it just to blend the fibres. Often around the muzzle, I will use the reverse needle to do this. 
Number two, needle holders. Do you ever feel like your fingers just don't feel comfortable when you're stabbing and you just want a more comfortable something to hold? Well, you can use a single needle holder. Uh, this is actually a wooden one that's been painted by my lovely mum. And it's really useful because you've got a little groove in here. You can put the needle in and you can put it both ways. So the first way you can just put it as a kind of holder to keep your needle out of the way so you don't stab yourself or let it fall on the floor. And then if you remove it and put it the other way, you pop the thin end in and then you've got your needle ready. So I always have my favourite needle here at the ready um, to just stab away. It's really comfortable. So here I am adding some long fur to my fox with a single needle holder which has a really lovely peacock pattern to it. I just put up here is a peacock pattern needle holder by Flock to Felts. So this one here is the Clover Multi Needle Tool. I use this an awful lot. You can fit three needles in, but I often just put the two in there. And again, it's really easy just to hold the needle. It comes with a lid, so you can put the lid on. I'm going to speed up to show, I'm not this fast clearly, but it just speeds up the work to have two needles. I'm making a feather here uh, ready for my sparrow and you can really just get so much work done when you're using more than one needle at a time. I just love to use the clover one. It's something I've had from right from the beginning and it's absolutely my favourite, one of my favourite tools and really nice flat things that you can make. I also use it for 3D as well for the sculpting, but it's perfect for making those flat features like um, ears, making feathers like this one, turning it over, doing the other side. And I just find that you can put a couple of needles in, get the work done. It just saves so much time. A little trim after, as you can see here. Now in this one, I'm just showing that I also attach things like these ears to the bunny. I use that needle just, it just helps to have two needles at the same time to really speed up my work. And here I'm attaching long fur to a donkey. Again, this clover tool is brilliant. It just, it makes things so much easier. And then we have the, you can have a four, five, even six needles in one of these holders. I'll drop all of these links um, down below in the comments as well. And um, this one here, I really would only really use this for things like ears. So I'm making an ear shape here. I am speeding it up so that you can see how it goes, but it really does make it so much quicker. And the needles, um, as long as you're going in and out and you're not going at an angle, they shouldn't break when you've got four in this tool. Um, I just keep these same four in the tool all the time. At number three is my earth mat, which I absolutely love. So you've probably seen a lot of the footage on this video that I use this green coloured mat. It's by the makers. It's great for the environment. The top layer is compostable. My old foam mat was just up to no good. It was um, basically holy. I would break needles in it. It was getting tired. So it also... Every time I felted something, the, the bits would come off onto the felt and I was forever removing bits of felt. Um, so I will just show you the two together. So then on the left, I've got the earth mat and on the right was my old blue foam. Quite similar in size, um, but just very different in quality and for ease of use as well. So you'll see that put together, we have a top layer, which is compostable. So it's great for the environment. You can just throw it away in the compost rather than being a pollutant of the environment and the bottom layer is firmer and you'll see that putting them on top of my old blue foam mat they are a lot thinner but that's fine I can put those onto my tabletop or onto my lap tray and when you kind of poke at the earth mat there is a great consistency it's really dense it's a different feel um, but it's great for felting. You still get that crunchy sound and the blue foam, it kind of, it's just, it's old and wear and tear and everything, but it's just like an old mat of blue foam. So 
when you use the needles in the earth mat, I just find that the needles go in better. It has a very different feel. It's great for the environment. It's cost effective in the long term. And when I stab through my wool onto the earth mat, which is made of wool itself, there's no bits left off afterwards as it was before. Nice clean and it's easy to clean as well. I love it. I recommend it. <laughs> the full review is on my website. Number four, we have knitting needles. Now you might be wondering why, but when I was making this lovely Bolognese dog, the one on the left is the needle felted one, the one on the right is the real one, bless her. I needed to have some lovely curly wool. So what did I do? I used some knitting needles. I wound the lengths of wool around the knitting needles, wet with water and I left to dry overnight. And then the next thing I did was just carefully remove the needles, let it dry further if needed. I just put it on this kitchen roll just so that any excess damp would come away. And you get lovely curls of wool to add to your animal. They're so lovely. Number five, measuring tools. Now don't underestimate the need for going back to basics and using a good old pen or pencil with a piece of paper. So I'm just drawing up a little draft of my hair. I went onto Google, found some Google images, and then I'm just sketching out, just trying to get proportions right. I'm speeding this up just to show you what I did with the hair, but I just want to kind of get in my mind what I'm going to do, the position I'm going to have him in, getting the shapes right, because when you're getting your wool out, you want to kind of compare to whether you're getting the right sizing, just drawing out his little hair. And I really do think about the basics, so think about the shape, but then I also want to think about the detail as well. So here's my hair, and I tend to start off doing this, a little bit of detail, the whiskers, and also think about the materials that I'm going to use. So am I going to use shapes of wool here? Am I going to use wire for the legs, or am I just going to use nice tubes of wool again? And what about the claws? Am I going to use wax or clay? And here's what I did when I was making my bumblebee. I looked at proportions, so I looked at the segments and the legs, lengths. I use this as a template basically so I can hold the wool up and, and measure up. And then when I was making this bee that I'd never made, this giant orange bee, I did a side profile as well so I could kind of measure up and make sure that I was sticking to my kind of design. And then when I was making my sparrow, I did a proper kind of sketch looking at every part of the bird right through to the feathers and the claws. And I did the kind of shapes in my mind. Am I going to use a big ball to start with? Maybe then add on the tail. I can measure. I try to get it sort of life size so I can measure from Google. I look at dimensions of what a sparrow measures from the length and also looking at the width as well. It's all about planning in my mind. So I would take my wool and I would kind of measure how much I might need. Always start with a, a kind of bigger piece, but then remember it's going to shrink to size and then there's going to be layers of feathers over the top. So I would proportion out roughly what I wanted. And then with my feathers, I sketched out how my feathers would lay together and the kind of colouring. And so I use this as kind of a, a planning board. You know, when you're planning a room with colours and, and detail, this is exactly what I do when I'm starting off a sculpture. So we're looking at the claws as well. I can measure how long the claws are going to be, I'm trying to get as lifelike as possible um, and give the detail that it needs. So when I get my wire, I make my feet for the bird, I can just measure up, make sure that I'm completely measuring things. And then when I'm doing a wire armature inside a sculpture, so with this donkey, I will again use my tape measure just to look at proportions. I have looked at skeletons online and I'm looking at musculature and 
you know, just thinking about every single part of that donkey. And then when I take my piece of wire, I can just measure up and check that I'm doing the right proportions for its head, its neck, and going down the spine area as well. So it's amazing how much you actually research the animal. You get to know all of the, the skeletal design. It's so amazing to create animals just from sculpting with wool. Number six, a letter opener. So yes, here is the letter opener, the bit you may have been waiting for. And I'm going to explain now what we do with it. This one has a thin end, a wide end, and a pointy end here. And I told you it was strange, the, this um, wonderful letter opener, um, but it's really useful. So you can wrap your wool around and you can get the right thickness, especially when you're making something like thighs on a bunny or on a squirrel. You can wrap it around the middle part, give a little stab just to secure it slightly, and then make sure you pull it off the thin end. So just give it a little bit more of a stab and it just gives that nice kind of thickness around the middle that you need. Now there are things that you can see online. I know that some of the artists out there use um, very similar kind of tools but I found that the letter opener is a really cheap thing. I'll put the link down in the description. Um, very cheap off Amazon and for what it's worth it's just really useful. I can get the two shapes more or less identical, the right thickness. I've measured the length along and then I've just wound it around the middle part of the letter opener. There's so much you can actually do. You can use the pointy end here as well to get a great ear tip shape. So you can put it down onto your wool and then pull the flaps over Give it a little stab before then actually removing it away very carefully and then just stab it into place. I'm using the clover tool here just because it makes it so much quicker and I'm also using core wool. I often use the core wool for my ears and then add the colour over the top to make them nice and thick. And then I'm just going to use a single needle um, just to make that point even more to shape. It's really just a guide, the letter opener, but it just makes it so much easier. And then the end, the thin end, I can use to start off shapes for legs. So just getting a start there, pulling it out again. I can just make sure that all of my shapes are equally the same size. I can also use it as a measuring tool along the length. Um, so I know that if I'm making two of something for my animal, which you quite often do, two legs, two ears, uh, two feet, that kind of thing, you can make sure that you're measuring very, very equally with your measurements. Um, I'm just folding over and demonstrating here that you can just take um, a piece of wool, make sure it's the right length and thickness and then you can do the same with your second piece using the tool. When I first got my letter opener I decided to score it up with some measurements as well using my measuring tape so I know that this centre piece is around 10 centimetres so I can measure from one end to the other and then score into place so I'm not using my measuring tape all the time can actually use this um, as a measuring tool as well. So I'm just going to speed up myself doing this but you kind of get the gist. You can use a marker pen, use a pencil, something that's permanent and then I also know, I'm not going to mark on here this measurement but it's really good to know what your measurements are of the width as well so you can use that accordingly. Number seven, wire and pipe cleaners. So I'll start off with the first of my favourite wires. This is a paper covered floristry wire. It's 22 gauge and you can bend it into shape to make little toes, uh, birds feet. It's very lightweight and it's something that's really useful for just getting those little details on your needle felted animals. 
you can also get it in just your local kind of shop for kind of garden tools um, this is just a little bit different not paper covered and um, slightly kind of plastic coated the second one here is the aluminium wire it's one millimeter in thickness and it's quite soft but it's really really versatile I absolutely love using this it twists really easily this is a Siamese cap that I was making for a friend and you can just see how you can use wire all the way through and this one here is a really really strong wire um, it's been reinforced and coated it's a little bit like a clothes line that you might put your washing on um, very tough not so easy to manipulate with your fingers but I love using this when I need something really strong and so here's an example of a little bird foot that I made for the sparrow and that's made out of the floristry wire and then using that really tough green wire that I just showed you um, for a stronger foot. Then we have the pipe cleaners. Pipe cleaners are my friend. I use pipe cleaners um, for very small armature such as my bee. Um, it can bend and twist, you can make little feet and cover them with wool or leave them bare depending on what you're making. They come in a variety of colours and sizes. They can twist together to make them even stronger. When I was making Mr Bumbly Bee, which is a giant bumblebee, I made the full armature out of pipe cleaners like this. I used the black ones so that actually I didn't need to wind the wool over the entire frame. Um, I made the antennae here and then the head and then I would carry on. But I would wrap the wool around the little antennae here and over the legs as well later on. So here's Mr Bumbly Bee. I've got a full tutorial on him. Please visit my website. You'll see here the, the basic stages of the bee as well. And then with the koala, oh my goodness, they have the weirdest feet ever. They have three toes and two thumbs. Um, you can see my little koala here, very cheeky one. And the other thing you can do is actually wrap the pipe cleaners over your wire. So with the aluminium wire, it's quite soft, but it can be reinforced with the pipe cleaner. It also makes a really good base to then wind the wool over the top of that so that it sticks really easily. You don't need to be using any kind of um, waxes or anything to kind of stick it on. Here is the little cat. I fancied a very bright day with the yellow that day. When I made the Shetland Sheepdog armature, I wrapped the pipe cleaners again over the wire. You can see the stages here. At number eight, pliers. So when you're working with wire, you really need to be able to cut them and bend them with some pliers. This has an end that has a flat end, and then there's also a little bit below that has a kind of cutter part for cutting the wire. These are flat nosed pliers. So I will just show you with a piece of wire here. This is a really, really tough bit of wire that I mentioned earlier. You can't just bend it easily. So you can use the flat end to manipulate it and bend into place. Um, this is great for making your armature when you want to make the joins um, in your limbs. You can also cut with the bit here. And then when you're using your floristry wire for smaller parts of animals, I find that the very end you can never really twist with your fingers. So the flat end is brilliant for that. And then you can actually just crease it right there and pinch it with the end of the pliers as well to get a great end. They're a brilliant tool and I'll drop the link again in the description for some pliers. So what do you think to the items so far? Leave me a comment below and let me know which one is your favourite. Still to come, we have those hair straighteners, we have eyebrow brush, and we also have some materials like clay and wax. Number nine, pins. Now I'm pretty sure you might have some pins around the house. So colourful headed pins are a must when you're measuring, where you're gonna put maybe an ear onto a dog, so let's imagine that I've not attached these ears so far and they were just loose. I would be sticking my pins in just to mark up, make sure it's symmetrical, make sure that they're 
in the right place before I spend all that time stabbing away at my wool. I like to use the darker ones like red ones on light coloured animals. I use the white one maybe when I'm using the darker animals. And maybe you want to put where you're going to put an eye. Um, just making sure that you've got everything lined up ready before you then go ahead and stab the wool into place. Now I'm going to pretend this dog is the back of a bird just to demonstrate that you can also use pins to put things like feathers onto your bird and you, again you're not going to waste time stabbing away and it, get it all wrong you want to just draft out where you're going to put them you might think about the angle uh, the positioning maybe you don't want them so high up so you can kind of move them around and test out where you want them to go first before you then start stabbing in once you've stabbed into place and they're firmly in position, then you can remove the pin like so. So that's just to demonstrate what you might want to do with feathers. Now it's not strictly felting, but when I cut out my templates for my wings for Mr. Bumblebee, I want to make sure that when I cut the shapes, they are both equal with the two for both wings. And I want to make sure that they don't fall off my organza sheet when I'm cutting them out. So I just use pinned in the same way just to place my template, which is made out of paper. I've made many holes in this before, as you'll see, um, just to demonstrate I'm putting the pins here and then I can cut out my template without the paper slipping off. So here are the hair straighteners that I promised you for number 10. So I don't straighten my hair anymore, but I had these just sat in my wardrobe doing nothing. I can change the temperature um, to the temperature I need. They're VDAS are soon, but you don't need to buy expensive ones. Believe me, you can use any old hair straighteners as long as they do the job. So when I'm making ears, I like them to be realistic as I can. And I don't want them to be too bulky and thick. So using the straightening irons, um, just for a few seconds, you can actually make a lovely thin effect to the ear and you can make a bit of a bend, a bit of a curve, there you go. Um, you can also make creases where you want them to be. I want this to be slightly off centre and um, I want it to be a kind of really lovely little curve on the ear just for that extra detail. You could also use just a normal clothes iron. Um, you could put a towel over it just to protect them from the iron. Um, but these straighteners are great. I also use the straighteners for making my feathers. I really don't want to have really thick feathers over my bird when I add them to a delicate little sparrow. I don't want bulky thick feathers and when you lay them together it just becomes far too heavy. So I want to straighten them with the straighteners and just a few seconds there and you'll see that it's so much thinner. It's brilliant. You can just lay them over lots and lots of feathers. Again, I'll do the same with this one. Now I like to leave a little fluffy bit at the end. That's the bit that I'm going to use to attach the feather to my sparrow. And again, you can see it nice and thin. You can also curl. Different to when you're using an iron you, with the strainers, you can make curls as well. So you can make that curl effect. I love it. I love just making those feathers. I also use the straighteners for when making these autumn leaves. And these are the leaves that will go with my little hazel dormouse. So my little sleeping hazel dormouse um, in a little nest of leaves. How cute is that? Number 11, scissors. Now, if you want a punk rocker effect on your badger, then obviously leave the long fur like it is. But maybe you just want to trim him up a little bit. Here he is afterwards. So I'm just going to show you the different scissors that I use. I love my old faithful nail scissors. They're so useful just for little things to trim them up. I'm just going to demonstrate just on a piece of merino tops here and um, just have a little trim with my scissors. You'll need to do this on many of your long furred animals just to get that end result. You can go snip inwards. I doubt wild animals have actual hairdressers, so it's best to make it as realistic as possible without a straight edge. And like all good hairdressers, I need to remove my trimmings. 
So I will show you the next one. These are hairdressing scissors. You can use professional ones. These are the ones that my mum used to use as a hairdresser that I've been using. So with these ones, you can get a really, really sharp finish. You can cut away a lot more than you can with the nail scissors just because of the size of them. And if you've got a lot of trimming to do, I really suggest that you get yourself a really good pair of these. There we go. And just to remove the fluff. So the next pair are the thinning scissors and they have teeth that enable you to remove the bulkiness and thickness whilst leaving still some of the length. So it's just to create that kind of textured look. And so you've not got a straight thick edge, you've got more of a tufty, rugged look to your finish. And I'll just demonstrate by turning it around just to show you. You can also use the scissors just to very carefully trim tiny bits as you go. Um, again, it will pull away only part of it. And there we go. That's a nice textured, realistic, fluffy finish for your long fur. This is the donkey being trimmed and the bee being trimmed. In practice, um, I often use my nail scissors because they're really useful just to get those little tiny fluffy bits that you just want to get rid of and even everything up. The bee would not be like a real bee if it was too fluffy, um, but I want it to look like a lovely fluffy little bee that you can cuddle. Number 12, eyebrow brush. So I don't use this on my own eyebrows, but it makes a great needle felting uh, tool. You've got the bristly edge there, and then on the other side, you've got the thinner teeth. I tend to use that for long fur, to spread out the fibres but I just want to demonstrate the more bristly side I use on my needle felted animals when I've reverse felted the fibres. So I've pulled out the fibres with the reverse needle and then I'm brushing it up with the bristly brush. You can use a toothbrush in just the same way. Now this baby bunny doesn't have any eyes or whiskers yet but I just wanted to demonstrate what I do with the brush here giving it a little trim and yeah, it just makes a really fluffy, lovely look. And here is the final bunny. I'm just gonna turn him around so you can see his cute little tail at the back there as well. Now he is cute, but I think he looks slightly realistic as well with all of that lovely bunny fluffy fur. Uh, what? Sewing needle? Yes, I know you probably doing needle felting because you don't want to sew anything in your life. Or maybe you're not any good at sewing, but it's fine. I'm just showing you the sewing needle because it's just really useful for helping to make your animals more realistic. So I've got my hair here and I mean, there is a bit of sewing in the fact that you are inserting a whisker, for example, into the hair using your needle. That's really useful for, for helping you. You need a nice long needle there just to insert the whiskers in. But I mainly, use it to help to spread out the little fibres as a finishing touch when I finished my animal. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so you can see. Um, I just take a normal needle and I tease the fibres away. Maybe they become flattened, maybe become maybe a bit fluffed up during the process of adding all the fur. And I just want to kind of make sure that I'm presenting it to my member of my family that I'm giving it to or the person that's bought it from me. I just want to make sure that I'm bringing out the fibres, making them look really fresh and not so fuzzy. And the needle is great. I can You can use a needle felting needle, but obviously with the barbs, you can end up tugging out a lot of the wool as you go. Um, and you can just go underneath the fibres and kind of fluff them out again. It just gives a really nice kind of finishing touch so that it looks the best it can. You also want to give that kind of wow factor if you're creating realistic animals. You want it to stand out that you, you know, there's lots of little detail there and separating the fibres rather than it just looking like a matted mess. <laughs> um, it just really helps for the overall look. Okay. So yeah, so this is what I do at the end, just carry on spreading out the little fibres, unflattening any that have become flattened. And second to last, we have clay. 
So this isn't strictly using wool, um, but when coming to make the bird's toes and adding the claws on, I thought I'd try something different. So this is air dry clay. While it's moist, you can mould it in your fingers really easily, flatten it, and then just pop it over the end of the floristry wire here and just make a little curve of a claw. Um, I can use wool and I do use wool quite often with my animals but with the bird I just thought it'd make a more realistic claw look. There you go. So some people use Fimo or Fimo, I can't, not sure how you pronounce it, um, clay which is one that you bake. But what I like about this is that um, you can leave it for 24 hours, up to 48 hours and it will dry in the air. This one's silk clay, you can get it very cheaply online or in children's uh, toy stores. Just to show you one that I have made already, it's a slightly larger foot, um, but this one's gone hard, it's been left for 24 hours and it's not solid hard like rock, but it has a kind of flexibility, almost like a rubbery feel to it. Once the claws are finished, you can wrap wool over the foot. And so here is the finished result. I hope you have a go, it's really fun. And then I just finish up by popping the leg into the body of the sparrow here. And here's the finished sparrow with his claws made out of clay. And finally, we have wax at number 15. Now one wax you can use is bead wax. You get it in blocks like this and you basically, you have the bowl here um, and then you have the candle part you can place the wax into the bowl um, and basically just melt it over the top of the, the candle. And you can use this for making realistic noses, claws, a variety of things. You can even use it to help stick the wool onto the um, wire. Um, but the one I really, really like to use is this one. And when I want to create a kind of textured, tussled look, on the hair. A lot of the hairs, when you look at them, they don't just have straight fur. They have these little twizzly bits. Um, and so I got that effect using this wax. It's a bee wax balm from the makers and it comes in a variety of tones. This is the light one. It's quite hard. It doesn't melt um, by heat, but it melts in your hand. So you take off a tiny, tiny bit with your nail or with a spatula. And then basically you let it melt with your body temperature. Tiny, tiny bit is all that you need. Once it's melted slightly, you can then, with your fingers, just grab a little bit of the wool. Uh, I'm just going to choose this bit here. And then just kind of twist it in your fingers and thumb. As the wax dries, it'll stiffen and create that lovely tussled look. I also use the wax to make individual claws by stiffening the wool in the same way. And here are those finished claws. Um, just another way of making claws. Like with the clay, I like to try out new things and I really love the look of the wax, uh, especially for claws and for making fur tussly. Wow, so we've come to the end of my top 15 favourite tools and materials. I really hope that they have inspired you on your own needle felting journey and to help you with creating those detailed and realistic needle felted animals that you so wish to make. So please keep watching and subscribe. I have loads more to share with you.